Hey guys, welcome back to Belgium. As you can see, I'm back home and this is officially the end of the Southeast Asia series for now. I might be going back at the end of this year, but we'll see about that. In this video, I will share what I have spent during the 41 days that I spent in Thailand, the 12 days in Cambodia and 10 days in Malaysia. I'm a backpacker, so obviously I try to keep my budget as low as possible. I will also talk you guys through all my recommendations, all my favorites, but also everything I did not like. Basically, all you need to know before you go. Let's get started. Let's start with when to go. When is the best time to visit Southeast Asia? Well, in general, the cool dry season goes from November until April for the mainland of Southeast Asia, which means that this is the best time to visit Thailand, Cambodia, Laos and Vietnam. For Indonesia and Borneo, the best time would be April to October. And for Malaysia, the best time is from February until August. The reason why I decided to arrive mid-October was because I wanted to make it to the Lantern Festival in Chiang Mai at the start of November. If you want to know all about the Lantern Festival, I highly recommend you check out the guide that I made because without it, I was lost. So I made it specifically for you guys so you know how to spend the best Lantern Festival for free. Other dates that you might want to plan your trip around is Chinese New Year, which happens at the end of January, start of February, but it varies every single year, so definitely double check. Same goes for Songkran, which is the Buddhist New Year, and this usually happens between April 13th and April 15th each year. They believe that water washes away bad luck. So during this time, everyone in the streets is fair game to be completely drenched by water pistols or even buckets of water and being smeared with talcum powder. And they don't mind if tourists get involved in the celebration. So if you feel like um, running around a city, making people wet with water pistols, you might want to plan your trip around this time. Ramadan is also important to take into account, especially if you are going to Malaysia and other countries where a big part of the population is Muslim, because during that time it might not be easy to find good food throughout the day. Um, however, Malaysia and other countries usually also have other cultures. You might be able to eat at an Indian restaurant, but definitely take it into account. And this usually happens April or May depending on the year. I arrived on October 18th, which meant that it wasn't the best time yet weather-wise. So here is the itinerary that I did to avoid the rain as much as possible. From Bangkok, I went to Cambodia, spent 12 days there, pretty much had no rain, only one night, but throughout the day, no rain at all. Then I flew to the north of Thailand for the Lantern Festival, had no rain there at all, flew down to Khao Sok National Park, were so blessed, had no rain for the two-day excursion. And then I decided to do the western coast first, because November is actually quite a good time already to do the islands on the west coast of Thailand. I then made my way down to Malaysia, where it was raining every single day. The weather was not great, but I feel like with Malaysia, you are getting a lot closer to the equator rainforest, so it is gonna be rainier in general. I then made my way back north to the east coast of Thailand, Koh Tao, Koh Samui, Koh Phangan. I made sure that I arrived there in December because November is the worst month when it comes to rain on those islands. So I really wanted to avoid that because there's no point in being on a tropical island when it rains every single day. On Koh Samui, when I just arrived at the start of December, it was still very rainy. Koh Phangan a bit less, but then Koh Tao was great. Um, and that would have been around mid-December. I just wanted to give you this information because um, I know that the weather is very dependent each year, but maybe if you also want to travel during this time of year, at least you know what to expect in which region of Southeast Asia. Next up is how to get around. Southeast Asia is one of the most backpacked regions in the world, so the infrastructure is great. I usually check on Rome to Rio or One to Go, or I just go to a local tour office to book my transportation from place A to place B. It is not like in Mexico where one bus company has routes all over the country. It is individual service providers each time. Most of the time, the transportation would then be executed in minivans. I also had very few big buses and I also traveled with one sleeper bus from Patambang to Phnom Penh in Cambodia on my way to the islands of Cambodia and 
I'm so happy that I was with a friend then because if I had to experience that with a stranger, it would have, yeah, it just wouldn't have been a great experience. But you can see that in the video I made about the Cambodian islands. You can also look for the ferries on Want to Go and on Rome to Rio, especially for moments around the full moon party or special dates. Make sure to book things in advance because you might be stuck in a place or have to think of creative ways of getting to your destination if you don't book in advance. In the big cities you can use Grab, it is just like Uber and specifically in Bangkok I thought the Grab bikes, which is just a motorbike that you get on the back of, were great to get around. It's also a great way of seeing the city in my opinion. Or you could take a tuk-tuk if there is more than one of you. On the islands most people rent a scooter, also in the north of Thailand, and they generally cost around 6 euros per day, which is very affordable. Also around the islands maybe you will want to make use of a water taxi. Those are long tail boats that take you to a certain beach, for example to Koh Nang Yuan, and a lot of the tours are also executed with these long tail boats. In Chiang Rai, my roomies and I rented a car to see everything that there is around the city, which was so great. And in total we paid about 10 euros per person, there was five of us, so we could share the cost the maximum amount, and that even included a full tank of gas. So 10 euros for a whole day of seeing the whole region was a very good price in my opinion. I took two flights with Air Asia as well, one from Phnom Penh, Cambodia to the north of Thailand, and one from the north of Thailand to Khao Sok National Park because I generally try to avoid flying as much as I can and I only did it in the cases where I would have lost two days um, in transit. And I already had a very tight schedule so I didn't want to lose those two days, actually four days because I took two flights. Um, but in general you can definitely do it without flying and I would recommend it. The prices with Air Asia are cheap but if your luggage in total weighs more than 7 kilos you do have to pay extra for your luggage. So that is why I would try to avoid it. It's a cost that you can easily avoid and save money on. Instead of taking a flight I highly recommend the night train in Thailand. I also made a separate video about my night train journey. On the islands they often use these pickup cars as a shared taxi around the island. Border crossings were super easy. Personally I'm from Belgium. When I arrived in Thailand I got a free 45 day tourist visa uh, instead of the regular 30 day one. Uh, for some reason for this specific period they have temporarily prolonged the visa. Um, but definitely check the current rules for your nationality. Um, but they change all the time. Crossing over from Thailand to Cambodia cost $35 more or less. I also made a separate video about my journey from Bangkok to Siem Reap as well as my overland journey to Malaysia where I got a free visa as well on arrival and then I also made my way back from Kuala Lumpur all the way to Koh Samui. You can also see all of that in the vlogs. Um, but yeah, I found the border crossings very easy, very fast. So no need to worry about those. Now we have gotten to where to stay. I personally stay in hostels because they are the cheapest and it means I can spend more money on activities. I always search for them on Hostel World and if I don't like the price there I will always double check on Agoda. I got a really good deal there um, and it made a certain hostel on Koh Samui more affordable. But in general also private rooms are very cheap. On Koh Tao, I stayed in a private room for 20 euros a night. If there's two of you, that's even better, because then you can split the cost. What I missed in almost every single hostel in Southeast Asia was a kitchen. In Africa, in Latin America, there's always kitchens in hostels, but in Asia, I can count them on one hand the hostels that had a kitchen, probably because eating out is so cheap, but still, like, it would have been nice. Also, barely any hostels included breakfast. I only had a few that did that um, and in general it was really good if they did, but it's really an exception. Most of the hostels just have a restaurant of their own and yeah, they just try to get extra money that way. However, a lot of the hostels had pets or pools or both, which we love. Some essentials that you must definitely have with you when you go to Southeast Asia is plenty of tops that cover your shoulders because you will probably be visiting temples and also obviously long loose pants or skirts. 
Also, an international driver's license will come in handy if you plan on renting a scooter or a car. It is a regular driver's license, just in English. Mine cost me 16 euros at my local city council. Also, make sure you have travel insurance. Make sure you have this on every single trip that you go on and an international plug. In Thailand and Cambodia, I could use my regular European plugs, but in Malaysia, the plugs were like in the UK. The plugs in Thailand and Cambodia were like a combination of the two round ones and the two flat ones. You could use either one of them. Then I will talk you through all of my favorites and the things I hated. But first, let's get into the budget that you will need to travel these countries. I have tracked my budget throughout the two months that I spent in Southeast Asia. I kept track of everything. I have put it on into my expense tracker that you can also buy over on my website. Check out the link below. And that way I can now break down my budget for you. Here we go. So here are my daily costs for Thailand. In Thailand, they use Thai Bot. You need cash pretty much everywhere except for 7-Eleven. So the average daily cost of transportation for me was 11 euros per day over 41 days. If I had taken buses instead of the flights, that would have been 6 euros instead of 11 euros a day. For accommodation, I also spent 11 euros a day on average, staying in a dorm room and those four nights in a private room. On food, on average, I spent 10 euros, but for myself, I really tried to stick to 7 or 6 euros a day. And then some days I just splurged, had a bit of Western food, and then I would quickly spend something like 20 euros a day. So everything balanced out to about 10 euros a day. But I tried overall to spend less than that. Then we get to the activities. Now I spent a lot of money on going out and on diving that maybe not everyone will spend. If you would also like to dive when you are on Koh Tao in Thailand, then definitely check the link in my description because not only is Koh Tao one of the cheapest places in the world to go scuba diving, it is also where I did my open water diving course and I have a 10% off link for you in the description. So you can get the cheapest, but also a great experience for even less money. The activities, including nightlife and diving, were 20 euros per day. Minus the diving, that would have been 13 euros a day. My daily total budget for Thailand was 50 euros. This includes the flights, the diving and the going out. Without the flights, my daily total would have been 64 euros. And without the dives, it would have been 54. So if you don't take flights and you don't like diving, your total would be more like 40 euros. In Cambodia, they pay with the Cambodian real and also the US dollar. The Cambodian real <laughs> is annoying because there are so many bills that you carry around and you have a purse full of bills and then you get to pay something and you still won't have enough. Like it still doesn't add up to enough and you can barely pay with your card anywhere, which I found very annoying. Transportation in Cambodia, 10 euros a day. Accommodation in Cambodia, six euros a day. Food in Cambodia, 17 euros a day. Especially on the islands, there was no way of eating a lot of local food. So yeah, you definitely spend more on food and drinks on the islands. Activities including nightlife in Cambodia, 15 euros a day. And the total daily budget for Cambodia was 48 euros. In Malaysia, they pay with the Malaysian ringgit. In Malaysia, you can pay with your card a lot more than in Thailand or Cambodia. They also speak much better English. In the Georgetown video, I explain you a bit more about my first impressions and stuff like that. Average transportation costs in Malaysia per day was 8 euros, accommodation 10 euros a day in Malaysia, food on average in Malaysia 14 euros a day, which is in between Cambodia and Thailand. And I would mainly say it's because of Kuala Lumpur, because the amount of restaurants that you have there, it's just so tempting to go for a restaurant meal instead of the local food. Activities per day in Malaysia was only 3.3 euros. In general, I didn't do much when it came to activities. Pretty much everything was just walking through a city and exploring it that way. And I barely went out when I was in Malaysia. There is less alcohol and it's a lot more expensive because it's much more of a Muslim country. So yeah, I spent a lot less money on going out and activities in Malaysia. The daily budget for Malaysia is the lowest 
In total, I spent 35 euros a day in Malaysia. Okay, now finally, I am going to share my favorites and least favorites. Favorites, let's start with food. Food in general is always a favorite, but especially in Southeast Asia. Oh my goodness, the night markets. I love a night market. I think that will be something I miss every day of my life. The street food is so good and I did not get an upset stomach at all for two months. I know some people do, some people do, but I don't think it's as common as for example in Indonesia or in India. My favorites in Thailand were obviously masaman curries. You have seen plenty of those come by in the vlogs. Uh, pad thai, uh, the banana pancake. I mean, the roots that I did is not just called banana pancake roots for nothing. They are incredible. I will always remember my first banana roti when I found out that it's not just a crepe, it's actually crispy. They are amazing. Mango sticky rice, the first time I tried it, I wasn't as much of a fan, but I guess it just wasn't a good one. But then from there onward, I had some incredible mango sticky rice. And obviously, 7-Eleven is a go-to for the very cheap toasties. Especially on a night out, I feel like no night out is complete without a stop at 7-Eleven for a toasty. In Malaysia, there is a lot of good Indian and Chinese food, but I found it a bit more difficult to really find what I liked there. But then Kuala Lumpur obviously had anything you can think of. And Cambodia, people say, is not that great when it comes to food, but I always had incredible food. I stayed away from the frogs and the rats, but things like amok, really great. All my recommendations when it comes to accommodation, transportation, restaurants, and activities you can all find on my travel planner of Southeast Asia that I have linked below. I have made an interactive map with every single detail on there and it already has the points of interest of other countries in Southeast Asia. More details will be added to this mammoth of a map as I go and travel and explore more places. So this map you can now buy at a super cheap price because in the future it will be worth at least five or 10 times that. I also have one that is just Thailand, Malaysia and Cambodia. And you also get the free budget tracker. So if you want to make things easy for yourself, then definitely check out my digital products. Now let's get to the things that I hated. Let's start with the most obvious thing, the animal tourism. I did not show this in a vlog when I was actually experiencing it. And I won't say where because I think this happens everywhere, but okay, I'll say it. It was around Bangkok, okay? It wasn't included in the tour that I was doing. At least it wasn't said that it would be. It was an extra stop that they did. We were explicitly asked not to film anything or like not to share this. So obviously they knew that this was wrong. I had an incredible day up until then and from then like the, the whole day was just kind of ruined for me. Not only the elephants that people can ride, also tigers, ligers, other animals that are used as um, for photo shoots. When we arrived to the floating markets, for example, there was people with giant snakes. If you know me, that's my biggest nightmare. Um, but yeah, they just uh, make you let you take pictures with them. And even though I hate snakes, still, I don't condone any animal tourism of any kind. Like, I didn't go to the elephant sanctuary because um, I was there around the Lantern Festival, so pretty much all of them were fully booked. And I didn't really see anything that sit well with me because if you're still touching the elephants and like yeah i don't know i don't know i'm still i still feel conflicted about this something that is very common in southeast asia especially cambodia and very much thailand is the prostitution and also the drugs as of september certain soft drugs have been legalized in thailand so you see it everywhere as soon as you arrive in bangkok you kind of have a feeling that anything goes like you can just do whatever however things being legalized for me does not mean that i am going to do them whether or not you participate in drugs on a destination is up to you but i prefer people to make money in sustainable and good ways. So I would much rather buy an extra souvenir than supporting those industries. 
but obviously that is up to you. Then along the same lines, I would like to say that the full moon party is overrated. It is probably the biggest party in Thailand. There were hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of people on this small beach, a lot of them high and drunk, and the amount of trash that just gets dumped on the beach and washed away and ah, uh, it just breaks my heart. I know that they do clean up the beach, but by the time they do, it might be a bit late. Yeah. As you know, I love diving. I love the marine world so much. It fit perfectly into my itinerary, so I went, but I would definitely not go again. It's also a very big sausage fest, like just guys trying to get the girls and um, yeah. And now I've ended the video on a bad note. That was not my intention. Um, I will insert some banana rotis and masaman curry to end on a good note. <laughs> anyway, I hope you liked this whole series and this video. I hope you found it useful. Uh, if you did, then make sure to give it a like and subscribe to see my next videos. I am going to backpack across Central America, all the way from Panama, crossing every single country until Mexico and I will be back in Mexico and I'm so excited all those adventures like I can't believe what I have planned like <sighs> finally I've been wanting to travel in this region of the world for so long and I'm finally doing it actually when this goes live I'm there subscribe thanks for watching bye mm -hmm.